Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. As always, I encourage you to join my Patreon. I have books and books worth of stuff on there, and I'm constantly adding to it. Um, it's my website, Radio Album, and don't forget Sven. I know we want to push that out of our minds, but that's not a good idea. Today's date is the, this is late on the 18th of November, 2023. And I want to talk about something that I find extremely interesting. I'm going to talk about the church's reaction, that is to say the Orthodox Church's reaction, to the Greek War of Independence, or the, the Greek Revolution. The war lasting from 1821 to 1825. This isn't just a revolution to drive the uh, Ottomans out. That's kind of a misnomer when you apply it to, to the Americans. This is an actual revolution. The church, and in this case, we have a, an essay by Patriarch Anthemios of Jerusalem and another um, by the martyred Patriarch uh, Gregory V of Constantinople. The two essays are about 25 years apart from each other. Uh, one 1798, and the other is from the very beginning of the Greek Revolution, 1821, leading to the Patriarch's death. The American War of Independence is very different from these continental revolutions. They were Jacobins in Greece. These guys were extremely wealthy. They were part of the, the Fanar ruling class. They were usually educated abroad. They were Anglophiles. And they sought a essentially a Freemasonic-based revolution in line with the French. Greek Freemasonry largely comes from England, but it also comes from the Carbonara of Italy and eventually brought into the uh, Grand Orient. So, these are the elite of society. The church doesn't like the idea of seeing the empire, Islamic though it is, upset because of what that might do to them. And again, Gregory V will uh, find out the hard way. But also because of the nature of these revolutionary organizations. And we'll talk about that here in, in a little while. At a minimum, they were Masonic. The island of Corfu, you saw the first uh, Greek Masonic Lodge founded. And it's not an accident that not only were so many members of the Greek Enlightenment um, educated in Venice, the first lodge in 1782 was on the island under the Venetians. And it was under the Grand Lodge of Verona. And at the time, there were a lot of wealthy Greeks studying in northern Italian universities, as well as points, points north. And uh, the, the French revolutionary concept was spreading everywhere, along with the spread of, of Freemasonry. So they began cropping up everywhere. Greek merchants, Greek intellectuals, everywhere from uh, St. Petersburg, to Vienna, to um, the islands off the west coast of, of Greece. To a great extent, these movements, their exoteric point of view was Greek independence. The esoteric point of view is the foundation of that independence. Because they were Greek only in name, they were not Orthodox, the overwhelming majority of them were um, part of the Enlightenment movement and, of course, partisans of the French Revolution. They didn't necessarily hate the church because it sided with the Turks, at least in, in words, if not in deeds, and also for, you know, self-preservation. They hated it because they hated the church. This was a revolution where all the institutions will be remade from top to bottom. 
many of you remember, when I first came back on the air in, I guess, 2017, my first talk was on the um, condition of the Orthodox Church in Greece and elsewhere under the Turks and what had developed. Um, this was the philatism issue, which comes directly out of this uh, intense level of corruption. The church did itself no favors. Every bishop um, in the Balkans had to buy their see. The contemporary documents are all over the place. There's no question about it. Um, and there were very few of them, and many of them weren't even, you know, they were businessmen. And I've, I've spoken about that several times uh, already. So, but after 1789, um, it was a Greek West Coast, you know, where Corfu is, uh, Philonia, Ithaca. And, you know, because it was in, in, under Venetian control, these people were able to function in, in peace. So the Grand Anatolian Lodge of Hellas and Corfu, um, you know, these, the consolidation allowed it to spread everywhere. The Greeks in Moscow were also uh, deeply Masonic, at least at the elite levels. These are very elite people. Ionis uh, Kapodistrias, who was a Russian foreign minister at the time, created uh, a Masonic Lodge based on the Greek elite, the wealthy Greeks. And this is where the Greek War of Independence uh, began. Now, there's plenty of good reasons. I mean, if I were alive at the time, I would have supported the, the Greek War of Independence, but not on the grounds that a lot of these people uh, accepted. The Lodge eventually took the name of the Phoenix Lodge, and you see this all over the place. This is, you know, in, in alchemy, the color is red. It's about the end of a process. It is the essence of, of revolution. That's the esoteric idea. The exoteric idea is that Greece is going to rise again. But what do they mean by Greece? Uh, Kapodistrias actually wanted to name the new Greek currency, the Phoenix. But they took drachma uh, instead. And this culminated in the Society of Friends, Veliki et Raya. Again, the phoenix was the symbol. And this was established in Odessa, the Jewish capital of Ukraine, September 14, 1814, as an offshoot of the Phoenix Lodge of, of Moscow. This was designed, at least from an exoteric point of view, that is to say a public point of view, to mobilize as many Greeks as possible, not just elites, to make war on the dying and suffering Ottoman Empire. No one was sad to see that empire go except possibly the British uh, because the, uh, the Ottomans going means that the Russians and the Balkan Slavs will have tremendous influence it, it, as deep as the Middle East. And yet the outrage of the Ottoman reprisals of the Greek Revolution, um, and, including the murder of Gregory V, um, in 1821, mobilized the uh, mobilized world opinion. These men, so-called Greek Enlightenment, um, and found in the uh, Filiki uh, Tadaya, or you know, Society of Friends, the friendly um, society, did look to Britain. And once the war began, you had British strategists, and at the end, uh, British naval presence to finally end, uh, as well as the Russians from the other side, to force Greek autonomy and then independence. This is, you know, the, the fact that they use Freemasonry, use the slogan to the French Revolution, this isn't an idea. First of all, it's not a nationalist idea. A, a huge problem I have in intellectual history is the idea that the French Revolution had something to do with the development of nationalism. Now, when I say nationalism, I'm talking about a politicized ethnicity. Uh, Johann Herder's point of view, the Romantic movement in 18th century, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 19th century Germany. The French Revolution 
uh, write in Article 2 of the Rights of Man, the goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man, liberty, property, safety, and resistance against oppression. Oppression, of course, um, thrown on altar. Now, in Article 3, they use the concept of nation, but that has nothing to do with culture or religion or even language. It's simply the society. I also don't like the idea that Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the inspiration. He was not. Rousseau, um, well, they actually mentioned the general will. That was a function of truth. Manifesting the general will was the purpose of society, not preserving these rights and procedures. Don't forget, Rousseau was anti-modernist. He rejected the idea of historical progress. It was an individualist um, ideology focused on property and the destruction of monarchy. Completely secularized, materialist, and based on the individual. But the claim is that man is born free, right in Article 1. And they remain equal in rights. And only when the general good is concerned do social distinctions matter. And of course, ultimately, that became a matter of wealth. The Filiki Etaria, Etaria um, was the main organization in mobilizing the armies in Moldavia um, and throughout the, the Balkans, either directly or indirectly under under Turkish rule. and But it wasn't just a militant organization. It was um, the foundation of the intellectual climate of the revolutionary uprising. And, and I've, I've dealt with this with the Serbs, too. It wasn't nearly as pronounced with the Serbs. But these Greeks, you know, who really didn't have much contact with Greece, they were cosmopolitan men. They spoke all European languages. The Greece that they wanted to resurrect and the Masons wanted to resurrect was ancient Greece, but still connected to the individualist and progress-oriented um, kind of ideology. And throughout the 19th century, these Masonic groups uh, based in Italy, um, it, had, it was 1867 where the Grand Orient created the, Grand or, uh, the Great Orient Lodge of Hellas. And of course, it was condemned, although not necessarily by name. The secret society was by name. Um, but it also represented to most people at the time um, the interference of foreigners, and in this case, especially the British, the British elite, in the affairs of Greece. These cosmopolitan leaders, you know, it, it, they came of age in, you know, the late 18th century growing wealthy, their families growing wealthy in the Fanar. They became merchants. They had money. Their families had money. And this is where they were paying for young Greeks to go uh, abroad, Western European universities. And that's where they came in contact with the Enlightenment. Um, people like Adamantius Correas and Timios Geises, um, they were deeply alienated men. They were wealthy, educated abroad, and came back to Greece as Jacobins, not Greek nationalists. By nationalists, the only thing that they could mean is the rejection of Ottoman rule. They were almost all pretty substantial critics of the Orthodox Church. I've said it before, but there's some good reason for that. But it wasn't just the level of corruption. It wasn't just because they, generally speaking, at the high levels, sided with the Ottoman government, but also because they were part of the Enlightenment. They were Jacobins. They didn't, you know, it was the church as such. Again, in an exoteric world, it's, you know, these kind of things, the corruption and everything else. The church did itself no favors. It was subject to the Turks. So, the first essay 
is called Submission to the Powers That Be, the paternal exhortation of Patriarch Anthemios of Jerusalem. And despite him being Patriarch of Jerusalem, this was written and promulgated in Constantinople in 1798. So this is just at the very beginning, where this revolutionary elite was just coalescing. It was right around the time of the very first Masonic Lodge being founded. This is why 1821 was so important, because all of these organizations and movements finally had the wherewithal, the money and the men, to launch uh, an invasion of Greece to kick the Ottomans out. So, Pancho Canthimios lists three reasons why he is writing this. The first, because it's a gift that he has, it's his job to teach people who to follow and who not to. Um, the second reason is that he has an obligation as a literate man, as a Christian man, to lay out, you know, to do what a bishop is supposed to do, which in, in, in the Balkans was very rare at the time, to lay down the law in no uncertain terms. And of course, these, the, these, these essays were sent to, you know, clerical deans and parish priests, and that's how these were disseminated. The third reason is interesting, because he also, he says, I'm, I'm awaiting the hour of death at every moment. In other words, he was very elderly at the time. And he wants his legacy to be as a tireless fighter for the faith. Whether it be in civil law, ecclesiastical law, he saw it as his mission, his job, his talent, his obligation. And he calls this movement the, the seat, the delusion of demons, trying to dupe using the most deceptive ways possible otherwise decent people. So again, the church had two reasons for having a huge problem with these Masonic revolutionaries. Number one was the fact that they were going to be, the reprisals were going to be severe, and the church will suffer, and Greece will suffer. And the second is the ideological foundation of these groups. I don't know what's going on out there. Someone's setting off fireworks. My dog doesn't like it one bit. I don't know what the heck is happening. Anyway, 1798 Patriarch Anthemios. He sees himself as a truth teller against this Greek Enlightenment, which again was just starting to coalesce as a political, uh, political or a civic organization. But it isn't just they're incorrect. It's that they're demanding to see their ideology imposed on all of Greece. And not only are they imposing their system by deceit and violence, it's probably going to fail, and in the beginning it certainly did, may or may not have popular support and will lead to retribution. It takes the patriarch a long time to get to his point. He sets up his argument in a few different ways. And of course, one of the first things he mentions, other than his own purpose, is to guard against deception. He starts off with Lucifer's fall um, and the, the condemnation of the fallen angels. Lucifer sinned with pride and arrogance against the dignity of God to set his own throne above the heavens. And imagining himself on high, clearly this is a pointed at the revolutionary movement, who not only wants to decide, you know, the Ottomans should be kicked out or anyone gets kicked out, but what the resulting society is going to be. You know, it was just a generation from 1789 to the Paris Commune. Now, mankind not condemned for eternity. He was deceived, but since we learn, since we're flesh as well as spirit, you were just ejected from paradise for a time. And the result is that everything is suffering, work, misfortunes, sickness, persecutions, tyrannies. That's the nature of the world. That's the nature of, and, and of course, if the sin bleeds into politics, 
and political science and rule. But of course, these are strictly transitory. And that to stop sin, we die. Our bodies decay, but from there, we can reach paradise. And he explicitly says that, you know, the, our, our sins are burnt away. Our worthiness, so to speak, is shown by the purgatory of the present life. And the reward, of course, is, is heaven. So from the expulsion from Eden onward, um, in man's exile, they were both taught about God and taught to reject God. Uh, sorrows of the present life are going to be everywhere. And really, the demons fell due to envy, because God loves this non-spiritual entity. So, upon Satan's fall, he is going to make sure as many humans, who he despises, as possible are going to fall. But the, I mean, all, all cultures have a memory of, of a paradise that's lost. But God raised up the prophet, slowly but surely educating at least a portion of humanity into what really matters, that we are not permanently exiled from, from paradise. And of course, ultimately, sending the Logos to take flesh. Now, he doesn't say so explicitly, but this arrogance and envy is precisely what the Greek Enlightenment was involved in, in the revolutionary movement. The present existence of life is going to be suffering no matter who runs things. So, at each generation, there seems to be a new roadblock. From the first persecutions, from the pagans and, and the Jews, realizing that this actually created martyrs, and so he was humiliated. And then, of course, centuries later, the heresies had developed, very much political in the sense that they separated man from natural law, or logos, and you have everyone from the Arians uh, denying the Holy Spirit, like the Macedonians, the Incarnation, the Nestorians, Monophysites, Monotheliites, Iconoclasts, and so many other. But even there, the devil was fooled, because that just built up the canonical tradition of the church and created more and more saints. He says they shamed the devil here. The fathers didn't allow the church to come to grief. But then he says that there's another period of persecution, and that's the West, a newer heresy. He's talking about the Latin heresy. It's different in name, but similar to the earlier ones. In fact, he led astray the entire West. And if that wasn't bad enough, then the Protestant Reformation destroyed Christendom. Lutherans, Calvinists, whatever. The, the heresy that engendered its own destruction with no unity, and ultimately the author of, of our decay, coming from, therefore, a, an unsound mind. So that's how he introduces this essay. He's seeing that revolutionary movements are formed, that the French ideology has spread, and that there's a small but wealthy group of Greeks who have adopted it. And let me quote him directly here. He raised out of nothing this powerful empire of the Ottomans, in the place of a Roman Byzantine Empire, which had begun in a certain way to cause to deviate from the beliefs of the Orthodox faith, and he raised up the empire of the Ottomans higher than any other kingdom, so as to show without doubt that it came about by divine will, not by the power of man, and to assure all the faithful that in this way he deigned to bring about a great mystery, namely salvation to his chosen people. Saying something like that, of course, is going to be People are going to be incredulous. We know the Ottoman Jewish alliance. We know the nature of the of the persecution. 
And yet the church received its patents from the sultan or his representatives. That not only, um, that not only is, is the, uh, it's almost as if the Byzantines destroyed themselves, which wasn't an uncommon topic at the time. And the Ottomans, at least in their mind, and how much of this he believed and how much of this was necessary is that's a, that's a separate issue. But understand that the revolutionary movement, I mean, you know, the, the modern world, that is the revolutionary movement. These are not uh, modern empires, you know, Russian, Ottoman, whatever. These are, these are medieval ones. And they're, you know, they're, they're adjusted over the centuries. In other words, the Ottomans were an, an instrument of God to destroy the decrepit Byzantine Empire. That seems to be the idea here. Hence, revolting against it is a terrible idea. The Patriarch was someone of an ethnarch, the so-called millet system, which can, can be exaggerated. But of course, the fact that he, like all the rest of them, um, well, at least in the Balkans, maybe not Jerusalem, had to buy his sea and was very dependent on the Patriarch of, of Constantinople, whose morale was at a very low ebb at the time. The Ottomans spread out in all directions, coming up only against uh, the Russians, which the, the consistent victories of the Russians over the Turks is one of the things that led to the weakening of the empire and hence gave room for a legitimate Greek nationalist movement, an Orthodox nationalist movement against, against them. The very fact that he says it's not by the power of man or ideology, it was an irresistible force. And just like all the terrible things that happened in the past, he kind of says this indirectly, it brings about a much greater good, the great mystery, he says. But then he mentions that careworn slogan, there is no power but from God. This is something that I've addressed many times. Under no circumstances could that possibly ever be interpreted as anyone with power should be there or is of God or from God. The power is the way to keep a minimum of social life. The big difference between um, Anthemius and Sergius of, of Moscow is that for the most part, the Ottomans didn't have an explicit program to destroy orthodoxy. They were in the process of it. But they weren't atheists. They weren't materialists. As the Soviets were. It was far more cut and dry in the, in the, uh, in the Soviet era and what the Soviet church was able to do. The patriarch here claims that the sultan has a heart from God. He says it's an inclination he has to keep free the Orthodox religious belief in the empire. And even, even keeping the church in line as an emperor would do. But the very fact that he's an emperor means that he was an irresistible force that should not be removed. And the patriarch was well aware of the people who were seeking to take its place, and he see how it, sees how it developed in France. But just like in the Soviet era, the patriarch starts to uh, uh, wax poetic about how the Ottomans are. You know, I've dealt with, you know, the articles in the journal of the Moscow Patriarchate under Stalin, where they call him the divine prophet and all this stuff. At least in this case, he is, in a backhanded way, saying this is a bad thing. But that bad thing can bring about something great. He goes so far as to say, the Church of Christ has all the freedoms that it used to have under the Orthodox sovereigns and comes to the building of churches uh, or throughout the empire. Imperial approval of Orthodoxy. But then he backtracks, saying that maybe the building of churches and imperial um, patronage 
is as much of a curse as it is a blessing. It isn't dignified in lavish temples that matter. It's the heart of the of the people. You want the Church of God, you know, St. Paul says, and he quotes him, that the old imperial churches, maybe the time has run out for them. And he, he continues to, you know, talk our citizenship is in heaven. We don't have an abiding city here, completely separating civic life and justice from the, the life of the church. And of course, I vehemently disagree with him on a lot of these. We're not just talking about the Turks. We're talking about the Jews. So whether it be that the Ottomans um, supported the church, at least indirectly, and it's true around this time, the Janissaries were running wild and challenging the throne. That was to occur in another generation. The same thing happened in, in Serbia. The Sultan looked like a better alternative to either the Committee on Public Safety or um, um, or Janissary rule. Then he finally gets to the point. He says, for this he, meaning Satan, has devised in the present century another artifice and preeminent deception, namely the much vaunted system of liberty, which perhaps on the surface appears to be good, but as to deceive, if possible, the chosen people. It is a trap of the devil. It's a destructive poison to drive the people headlong into corruption and confusion. It isn't so much that Greece shouldn't at some point be independent. The people who bring it about and on what foundation is a completely separate story. He talks about the system of liberty. He's talking about the rights of man. He's talking about the French Revolution. And in Greek, that was just the word, that you know, an abbreviation. You know, the modernist uh, French revolutionary Jacobin idea. That sounds good only on paper, which is exactly the problem. One of the ways we know that French culture, French national life has nothing to do with the revolution, in fact, the revolution is a negation of it, is that everything is abstract, everything is on paper. These rights of man, um, they're not grounded in anything. Um, now, of course, you know, Rousseau re would have rejected the rights of man because for him, the general will was far more significant than any uh, procedural method or any right. He didn't talk in those terms, but of course, the Jacobins did. But a lot of the evil things seem good on paper. It seems good in, in a fantasy that you might conjure up, literally in, in this case. The Orthodox faith, he says, flourishes in this powerful empire. The Orthodox faith is a negation of this liberty, this French revolutionary idea. And because it sounds good on paper, and you could come up with various fantasy ideas about it, it can capture even the most, um, even the most uh, devout. Because so many in the, in the Greek Enlightenment and the revolutionary movement uh, we're talking about Orthodoxy and the Byzantine Empire, but that was for the public. In private, it was a very different story. But it isn't as if um, no one knew what would happen when this system was imposed. Same thing for the Soviet system. What happened in France is what happens to all revolutions. Civil war. Ideologies and positions hardened to the point where only a military dictator um, could ever sort it out. It talks about he talks about the, the boastings of these people, and yet he knows what Venice was. He kept, comes right out and says it. He knows what happened in France, not just France. He's talking about here. He says that this ideology is contrary to the word of scriptures and that of the holy apostles. Again, he brings up the we have to uh, subject ourselves to the superior powers which is a, a, a falsehood. Um, and then to recognize that we're always going to have uh, tribulation. But even transitory goods, they will not be able to provide. Um, and the very next paragraph, he rips into Venice. He says, where now 
the inexhaustible treasure of the very ancient serene republic of the Venetians. Everywhere this illusory system of the diabolical one has led to poverty, murder, damage, rapine, complete ungodliness, spiritual destruction, and vain repentance. Those of you who have been following me for a long time know what the northern Italian republics were. They also had a strong connection to this ideology of liberty in that property was the dominant right to be protected, leading to the creation um, of an oligarchy. That was the origin of republics in the, uh, in the modern world. Over and over again, he talks about the obedience that any civil government commands from anybody. And I can only assume the French revolutionaries would be the same way, but obviously that's completely indefensible. So he doesn't even say that there's transitory goods in this ideology. Liberalism, republics, rights of man, revolution, masonry, these are almost synonymous. And certainly they're synonymous as far as the church are concerned. It's the exact same movement seen from different points of view. Uh, points of view. He actually uses the word oligarchy. And what is aimed at by this freedom is a hated oligarchy and tyranny, as experience has shown. And he's talking about Venice, the rule of interest, the rule of usury, money over all things, everything perverted to, to mammon. That's the nature of this system. That's why in the rights of man they mention property several times. But he goes farther than that. He says, he, he's talking about analysis of this modernist ideology. Now, he doesn't talk about monarchies or aristocracies. But he denies the fact that this Republican liberalism can never create an actual democratic a representative form of government. I'm going to quote him again. When we say government, we must mean a group of men by nature of different constitutions who inhabit one and the same state, that is, the strong and the weak, the healthy and the sick, the wise and the ignorant. Can freedom then exist among them? The most interesting part of this is the three options he gives to define the word freedom. And which one of them is correct? Which one of them is, is promoted by which system? The first he mentions is simply freedom of the will. It's a disposition of the rational soul, fortified by grace, leading men to the good. Not necessarily compelling him, but nudging him there. The second is the abstract freedom, as Hegel would, would, would put it. The freedom of the French Revolution to be unhindered in putting into practice the appetites, the passions insubordination to everything, including your own soul. And finally, the one who, of course, he accepts, freedom is the ability of someone to live according to divine and human law, to live free of every reproach of conscience and free civil discipline. In other words, you rule your passions rather than having the passions rule you. The freedom that the French revolutionaries were talking about exists on paper. It's, it's abstract. It doesn't tell you what decisions to make and on what grounds. They don't even tell you where the rights come from. But if you throw all these different people together in one state, who's going to rule? He says the powerful will dominate the weak, the healthy, the sick, the wise will deceive the ignorant. What order can then remain in such a government? And what morality when the passions rule? What safety is there for the citizens when rapine prevails? The revolutionary concept of, of freedom that he's um, connecting to the French Revolution and these um, Greek revolutionaries is in number two above. To be unhindered in pursuing your appetite, your desires, and in subordination. And he says only the third one is a liberty worthy of the name. And yet that has absolutely no place in the mentality of, of revolution, whether it be North Italian, um, French, or of course even earlier than this, the British under, under Cromwell. He was a very well-educated man. He was quite aware of what happened in the Glorious Revolution. And for all of them, usury, 
banking, manipulation, playing the law. That's what comes to rule, not liberty, not representation. Because the freedom that one individual has, who isn't a multi-billionaire, is almost non-existent. But he also says, well, to use our language, they're either sociopaths or are constantly suffering with the reproach of their conscience. They're already deceived, and so they spend, just like the devil, spend time trying to uh, deceive others. You can't focus on the kind of freedom where you could do whatever you want, you know, within the law, but not saying who makes that law. Or um, vague things like, well, so long as what you do doesn't contravene the freedom of others, which means absolutely nothing. Even words like harm, the harm principle, John Stuart Mill, don't say very much. The liberation of the Jews, the sexual passions, E. Michael Jones talks about uh, to a great extent, their attack on marriage. He's talking about that in the very late um, 18th century. When you have a regime dedicated uh, to the freedom and the second type of freedom, just pursuing whatever you want, pursuing your passions, you can't have a society, let alone an ordered society. You can't have freedom, he said. It can't exist in government without faith in God. God has to be the final end. Man doesn't set his own ends. And we know what that's like now. The media decides what's true and what's false. The church fathers, the apostles, the faith itself. This, these are the pillars of justice. You can't have a goal or an end that's just you. Because the minute that's placed into law, as it was in, in France, in the early Soviet Union even, there's nothing but your desires to follow. And it's very hard to avoid falling into the will to power. Of course, this man is, is a monarchist. He sees the murder of the monarchy in, in Britain and in France, and of course, he didn't realize this, but in Russia, not too long afterwards. It wasn't that long ago I did a uh, talk on uh, Venizelos, the um, prime minister of Greece in the 20th century. Actually, the Metaxas uh, talk that I did, I think, over the summer. These divisions between you know, Christian traditionalism on the one hand, nationalism, and the rights of man on the other, that hasn't gone away throughout the 20th century. That's going to tear the country apart. If you remember on that lecture I gave, you had usury, the domination of Britain, uh, the Liberal Party created in London, because if they're going to accept an independent Greece, it's going to be in their interest. And that's why near the end, the French and the, uh, and the British Navy challenged the Ottomans as the Russians were doing damage on the other side. To accept this ideology is to, to abandon your conscience. You can't even give, he says, the slightest hearing to this. And I've already said it, but with all of these abstract rights, you fill in the content. These are just words. The content that is filled in by your fantasies. So he talks about steadfastness and prudence, having an end outside of yourself. That is not physical. That under no circumstances do you have, can you function with that kind of freedom? That ideology revolving around the passions doesn't give anyone any impetus to not overstep. Who writes these laws? And it's the same mentality where Lucifer saw himself as ruling over all things and hence attacked God. The exact same thing happens in the garden, the same thing happens in this new set of barriers, and that is the, the age of revolutionary ideology. So that's the first essay, and he spends a lot of time laying out what this new ideology is, what this new, um, uh, what this new um, heresy, so to speak, it's not a heresy, but um, this, this latest uh, attack on the church and that the Ottomans are, if that's your, our only option, far preferable 
to the Committee on Public Safety that so long as we're alive, freedom is not only unattainable in the, in the liberal sense, but impossible and could never lead to, to virtue. More than anything else, virtue is important because we can very easily rationalize our behavior. So the second essay, uh, this is from the new martyr, uh, Gregory V. He was Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, and this is his anathema against the uh, Filiki um, Italia, as I've mentioned already. And this was done in March of 1821. And it's going to be the last thing that this patriarch does. I'll get to that here in a minute. For a lot of letters like this, encyclicals, they establish their authority first and foremost. And then they insert, as we already talked about, their point of view within this concept, the unfolding of, of this history of salvation. And he stresses the idea. He, he talks about the geographic expanse of his, of his patriarchate all over the Greek speaking world. So this is a more specific condemnation. The first one was really about, you know, very general uh, caution about what is developing, what's developed in France and Britain, and what's on its way to Greece. Here is something very specific, since he names that group by name, explicitly. Again, it's a very similar tone, in that the Ottoman Turks are part of the reason why this Greek Enlightenment, men have already mentioned, have become so wealthy. And that's why one of the first things he says is that the first precept of ethics, practical precept of ethics, is gratitude towards benefactors. And the worst of men are those who spit on their uh, their gifts. And this is a great evil, especially in, in social life. He even connects it to Judas. Uh, ingratitude accompanied by an evil and insubordinate spirit. He then calls the Ottoman Empire uh, our common, generous, solicitous, powerful, and invincible empire. Established from God as a form of punishment so that a greater good can come out of it. He, again, just like Patriarch uh, uh, Anthemios, cites Romans, for there is no power but from God. And that's not a, an excellent translation. There's a big difference between power and authority. By the time he's writing this, the the um, the revolution had begun, and the sultan is looking to him as sort of the you know the chief of the of the Christians to get his people under control. Because the worse things get, the more obnoxious the janissaries are going to become, and that's something you really can't deal with. Now, he talks about someone specifically, the Prince of uh, Moldavia, uh, Mikhail Sutsos. He also mentions Alexander uh, Ypsilantis. Of course, two leaders in the revolutionary movement, despite one being, and this is for, this is for Moldavia, is where the first invasion came from. He was installed by the Sultan himself to run Moldavia in 1819. So again, he talks about this total lack of gratitude. Everything that these men have come from the fact that they were from a privileged aspect of the Greek nation within the Ottoman Empire. Not only does this kind of thing invite retaliation from the Turks, but also from the Jews. I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. Jews did very well, of course, under the Ottoman. They had a hand in the creation of Islam. They have always supported Islam against uh, Christianity. And they hated more than anything else this idea that you had this huge Russian Roman Empire to the east that at the time seemed unassailable. And yet at least the Ottoman Empire is Islamic so we can keep the Christians at bay. I've dealt with this in, in 18th century Greece, uh, no, sorry, 19th century Greece many times in the past. 
uh, Ypsilantes, also very wealthy man, most of his life uh, abroad. But it was the Hospodar, the prince of Moldavia, where the revolution first began. But he talks about Mikhail, says he was a nobody in a humble, insignificant position, and he was brought to rank and greatness. He went from a nobody to glory and honor. It enriched him, it nurtured him. It finally honored him and made him a ruler of peoples. And the it is the Ottoman Empire. But because he is ruled by his passions, he appears to be an ingrate monster, to quote uh, Patriarch Gregory. And he's talking about the beginning of this revolution, where from there, raising an army with their money, based on Masonic principles using the tricolor flag, announce the freedom of the nation. Which, given the time period, was extremely irrational. He was right in that sense, not that I want to justify the Ottomans, but at the time, a lot of Greeks are going to die. And the only reason it ended up succeeding was because of Russian, British, and French intervention. It was very early to be raising an army. The role of Russia here, um, the, you know, the patriarch says that these revolutionaries used Russia as a way to strengthen their ranks, making the claim that the Russians were in agreement with their thoughts and actions in the revolutionary movement, which at the time wasn't the case. But that's just not true. He says it's a creation of their own ill will and a product of their imagination. Relations between the Ottomans and the Russians were bad at this point in time. Yes, it's mostly Russian action that brought the Ottoman Empire to, to nothing. But the ambassador, uh, the Russian ambassador to Constantinople, wrote a letter saying that the Russian state had no knowledge or share in this invasion. So many, even even of these, even of the Jacobins, even of uh, the early revolutionaries, many of them thought it was too early. And all they're going to do is call down violence against Greeks who are already suffering. And the Russians said, we had nothing to do with it. We were against it. We would be against it if we knew about it. And this is an evil plan in his mind for a lot of reasons. One big problem here is that he seems to think that the position of Raya, Raya is essentially the, the Turkish um, Goyim. It's an insult. He, he sees it as just a, a one position out of many. It's a free estate. He says, This they enjoy under the vast shadow of the empire, privileges of such freedom as no other vassal and subject nation enjoys. Where the freedom of the Orthodox Church is uh, is laid out and protected. Again, it's not too dissimilar to um, um, to the first essay, and of course, Patriarch Sergius and his people later, over and over again, they talk about the atheists against the beneficent empire, the invincible empire. And he says, they're hastening to bring common and general ruin on the whole nation. Those who are given over to piety, those who are prudent and honorable, strict guardians of the holy canons and divine laws, will not pay attention to the lives of these villains and evildoers. The main revolutionary organization, which I've already mentioned, was founded on the day of the Holy Cross. But of course, its symbol was the phoenix. In other words, their Christian... Um, uh, uh, symbolism is just that. It's rhetoric. That isn't what they want to see in Greece. The Serbs had a much better time of it there. The Greeks had a almost a universal um, sympathy in the West simply because they're Greeks. Now the ancient mentality, not the medieval mentality, is what this, this movement wanted to uh, wanted to impose. 
And just like the first one, he's saying, I have an obligation to talk about this. He doesn't mention the first essay, but it's very clear um, uh, that the spirit is exactly the same. And he's spreading this message out. We can't allow this movement for numerous reasons to spread. He says we have to hate them. We have to stigmatize them as common bringers of ruin, of arrogant people, deceit, intriguers. To report these guys. And of course, that came a little bit too late. The Sultan absolutely blamed him for the um, for the revolution, which really had, had just begun. The Russians had nothing to do with it, although, of course, later that changed. Russians had chipped away at Turkish morale and Turkish territory, and of course demanding at some point um, a free Greece. Using the word raya is, is bothersome. It's a subject person rather than a citizen. It's a non, it's a second class citizen. It is, it's, it's synonymous with cattle. And either he, he, he doesn't define it that way or, um, he doesn't use the term that way. That being, uh, raya is to be, uh, free and to be hardworking. He goes so far as to say you must hate these people both in your thought and your speech, those desperate fugitives, those destructive traitors. The church and our Greek nation also hates them, and they will heap upon their heads the most horrible and atrocious curses. So at an absolute minimum, he's talking about as simply being too early, that these elites only have their money and power because they are privileged parts of the empire. I started off by saying the church didn't do itself any favors, and that's certainly true. It isn't as if these nations were going to like the church if it was less corrupt. But the canonical status of these men, and the martyrdom, I think, overtakes that, but is very much open to doubt. There was simply no other way to take a parish, to take a deanery, to take a diocese. And, of course, the patriarch himself went to the Jews, went to these very same Fanar, Fanar wrote in, and had to borrow the money. There are many documents from the from the era, late uh, 18th century, that, that lay it out. He's talking about the abuse of insubordination. What's going to happen? I mean, even if even if the revolution succeeds, the church is still going to suffer. Turkish retaliation was severe, and almost this very day. March 1821, Patriarch Gregory V was murdered. Now he has a list of bishops, probably about 15 of them, who signed this. Actually, it was, wasn't that same day. It was Easter Sunday, 1821. Very, very shortly after this encyclical, this anathema was, was laid out. I'm going to quote... Um, some of it, it comes from Robert Walsh, who was living in Constantinople, uh, who wrote substantially, because he was there for the whole thing, the start, progress, and termination of the Greek and anti-Turkish uh, revolution. Uh, the sultan at the time was uh, Mahmoud II. And no matter how pro-Ottoman he tried to be, the Turkish elite didn't buy it. So this description from Robert Walsh talks about crashing right after this thing was was published, crashing into the cathedral and dragging him out. They tortured him to death in front of everybody. It didn't it took him quite a while to die, and they hanged his body outside of the gates. And I want to quote him about what happened after death. Whenever the Turks intended Anything particularly insulting and contemptuous to Christians, the Jews are made the instruments. Balata, the Jewish quarter, was immediately to the rear of the cathedral. So they took from this district some of the meanest and basest they could find, even among that degraded populace. The Greeks had humbly begged the body of the venerable head of their church, 
to inter it decently when the period of exposure was passed, that is, when they were hanging it. But this was denied them. The body was taken down at the end of three days, and the rope, which was suspended, was put into the hands of Jewish officials. They were ordered to drag it by the neck down to the water. It wasn't a far distance, but the way was through a very dirty market where offals or excrement of all kinds were lying about in foul masses. Through these they drew him with gratuitous insult, exulting, as it were, in the detestable employment in which they were engaged, and after defiling the body in every way, it was cast into the harbor where the waters closed over it. The conduct of the Jews on this occasion was considered as an indication of the deadly hatred they bore for Christians. Ultimately, of course, the Jews will abandon the decrepit Ottoman state. But no matter what is happening, no matter what movement is taking power, if it's explicitly orthodox, they're going to be hated. All the revolutionary movements, to the extent that they stressed orthodoxy, were attacked. But the fact that so many of them were Masons means that they already had a connection with Judaism and, and the Kabbalah. Now again, there's very good reasons to support Greek independence, then and now. But Greek independence came about under the worst possible conditions, using the worst possible patrons. But I suppose that's where the money was. The national schism in Greece, I've talked about this before, between liberalism and traditionalism, between Athens and Byzantium, so to speak, Athens and Constantinople, is it's found everywhere. Again, Serbia, Bulgaria, a little bit better off. But ultimately, Greek, the independent Greek state was carved out by a combination of Russian and French involvement and installed a basically a, a um, semi-liberal constitution under British auspices. Because the Turks, because of this, and by the way, after Gregory's murder, the Turks went wild all over, not, not just in, in uh, by the cathedral, but the entire empire. There were Greek massacres everywhere. And the Jews were always front center for all of this. That's not the only thing he says about the Jews. Even the, even the Wikipedia article notes that the Jews were heavily involved in all of this. Feliki, Tadaya was a Masonic cult. Its nationalism was, had nothing to do with tradition, culture, language. It had to do with the Renaissance. It had to do with resurrecting the ancient alchemy. You can have a secret society for the sake of counter-revolution. It doesn't have to be Masonic. And it came from the worst of the free Masonic cults. Yes, the group was founded on the Holy Cross Day, the miraculous victory of the Byzantine Empire uh, against the combined Avar Persian siege in 614 AD. Constantinople was in dire danger of falling to the barbarians until the patriarch ran across its walls with an icon of the Mother of God, which is now on Mount Athos. Well, they see that today, seeing the pre-modern or the medievalist Turks and the Orthodox Church as these very same barbarians. If you remember what, what they mean when they talk about Greek independence, what is Greek to them? What is independence to them? And the British were essential to, to all of this. Many Greeks were killed, and ultimately it was a righteous cause. But the Greece that they created was anything but the old Byzantine Empire. These two letters, these two patriarchs, are extremely important. You, you, no way I'm agreeing with everything in there. They got heavily involved in politics for their own self-preservation. And despite him being pro-Ottoman, it didn't save Gregory. And the Jews were front and center of the, of the entire thing. And the Grand Orient Lodge of Hellas eventually came to rule over all with British support. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.